it's been a great privilege to read this book and to do this interview. Um, I, I was absolutely glued to the book for two days, absolutely read it cover to cover and then a bit more and pages and stuff. And um, I just want to make a few bullet points that I felt that you covered. And I felt that your work in this book demonstrates an extensive knowledge of the field. The auto-ethnographic nature of the book, it's honest, open and frank, addresses some very social, difficult and awkward questions and awkward contexts. It's like an archaeology of contemporary techno-sex, where everything is questioned and exposed from sensationalism and fantasy to nuts, bolts, batteries and AI responses. It challenges assumptions surrounding sexual predilections. It challenges assumptions surrounding the uncanny valley. It's deeply philosophical. It's scientific explanatory. It's socially challenging feminist ideologies, body image and gender. It debunks radical campaigns against robot sex. It clarifies definitions and questions design. It's deeply funny. It's deeply personal. It's culturally engaging, including reference to popular film and media. It's futuristic in abstract thought and encouraging innovation in education. It's legally prophetic and ethically radical. And I think it's a, a really excellent book. And I think, um, I just want to give you a round of, of applause for doing something so phenomenal. I, I thought you were going to say, and it's full of really bad puns and innuendo. Oh, no. <laughs> and, and, you, well. and you mentioned me in it, which was wonderful. Thank Australia. you so much. Thank you. Um, so let's, let's get started with some ideas of um, what, made you plan the book you way the way that it, it, it reads because it, there's, it's autobiographical and it's really touching it is a bit I get quite personal in it yeah um in places I was I was really because I'm really interested in the in the human side of it sort of what what does it mean for us in a technological world and you know I'm, I'm by no means the first to, to talk on this topic I mean Trudy you've been working this for years and David Levy who's here tonight as well has been absolutely visionary in the field so you know I was coming along going Ooh, what's happened over the past decade and what's changed and uh, we finally got to the stage where science fiction is becoming science fact with the release of the first commercially available sex robot sort of um, and so I was really interested in that you know who are the people who are going to buy these and what do we think of them and why are the newspapers coming out with these bizarre headlines which you know <laughs> yeah. yeah tell me about it I've had 30 years of bizarre yeah. headlines <laughs> no, no let's not go there um, so I mean, what have, what's been the nature of the people that you've been meeting that are engaging with sex robots too? Because they get a lot of stick. They do. And I find that really interesting and quite, quite moving in a lot of ways. So I went out to California last summer um, to go and see the first sex robot in production at Abyss Creations who make Real Doll. And I went there thinking I was going to really, really not like it because to me, these are very stereotypical, cliche, reductive female forms that I just think are kind of sad really and then I went there and I saw the workshop and I saw the craft that went into them and I was really really impressed because these as a piece of art in their own right um, are, are very beautiful things um, and then as I got talking I went onto a lot of forums that doll owners use and got talking to people and just the sense of community that came up that has grown up around it so everyone thinks that in the person who wants a sex robot or a sex doll is a very lonely person in their basement and I was just struck by how much of a community spirit there is. There are people who they meet up with each other, they keep in touch with each other, they become friends. Um, and in fact, the technology that we think are is, is isolating people is actually bringing people closer together. And for me as a tech optimist, I think that's a lovely thing. How did you actually feed into getting the confidence from people who actually have sex robots to talk to you about it? Because it's a, it must be really difficult to actually enter that milieu of, of, of behaviour. Uh, not, not too, it was not, not too bad actually, because um, there's amazing people like Dave Katz, who is really active on Twitter and is very, very open about his relationships with his three dolls that he lives with um, and he was able to put me in touch with other people and, and tell me sort of the insider scoop on it all which was really really nice and the companies making them have been really helpful as well and they're they they know they get a lot of stick about what they do too um, and I think they they are genuine in that they want to provide companionship to people um, 
And so whether or not we think that is ultimately a good thing, they are very genuine in what they want to do. So the other thing I found really interesting is because you did uh, you did a lot of um, sort of archaeology and things, didn't you, before you started doing back, this? Back in the old yeah. days. Yeah. <laughs> I found it really interesting because there, there was like an archaeological bent to your discovery. Yeah. I, I loved doing that bit. It was sort of the first the first chapter is sort of a, a almost a, a look back in time through where this has all come from. And there's two sort of strands to it. We have the strand of the sex doll, which is a bit more recent, but the idea of that goes way, way back. And I, I spoke to... Um, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> Who oh, brought no, that good. sex robot uh, in here? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, so I spoke to um, um, a friend of mine, who's a classicist, who's been working on, on themes in... Um, classical Greek for for years and um, she was able to point out stories uh, that reflect the idea of the sex robot far earlier than Pygmalion which is the one that we are all familiar with and then just looking back at the history of sex toys which is fascinating so you know we have these phallic objects from 28,000 years ago um, that may or may not have been used for sex archaeologists are, are quite conservative about <laughs> by that um, a real ceremonial um, and, and we get right through to um, we know for sure that there were sex toys in use in, in ancient Greece um, we have writing about that and pictures of those um, but right through to to the way that the nature that sex toys have changed over the years and they've moved away from pretty much genital replicas through to something very abstract and beautiful which I find fascinating it's taking a design aspect um, and there's been some great work on that recently by people like Hallie Lieberman who's done a history of that um, and Cynthia Amoya who, who did a, a, a doctoral um, thesis on it so I think that was just digging into that was just absolutely fascinating for me it was mix, mixed the things I like which is you know <laughs> sex toys and archaeology yeah. <laughs> <laughs> I didn't mean it like that but yeah <laughs> Now, taking on, uh, just going forward into the future from that, one of the things I found really fascinating, and I was really privileged to be invited to the Sex Tech Hackathon. Oh, that was so much fun. Uh, well, the first ones, I was one of the judges. You were. And, and you were encouraging students to really outthink design in terms of uh, sexual behaviour and sex and technology. And I think that was such a brave step for you to do. And the, the whole team that was doing it was absolutely they were fascinating. Amazing, weren't they? Yeah, yeah. we had amazing Hacksmiths, which is the Goldsmith Tech Society, were just absolutely phenomenally amazing and well organised, unlike me, who went, Oh, we'll get some people in a room and we'll sew up some vibrators. And they went, No, <laughs> we're, we're, we can do better than that. Um, and they, they did amazing work. And we had the first year, we had 50 people um, in a deconsecrated church just before Christmas. So that was nice uh daily meal we're really on board with that um and, <laughs> and we said you know we want to we want to explore um should taboo stifle innovation uh, what are the limitations here why why are people and we, we wanted to move away from the idea that you had to have sex toys sex robots that look human and we said you know, what what other experiences are there and Trudy your work was really influential as well the idea of immersive experiences in VR and just the potential to break down the boundaries of what's there and, and try new things and I think I was so impressed by the stuff that came out I mean they were we had such a hard time judging that because they were just incredible, you know, mad things like soft robotic tentacles that could curl around your body. Or well, you mentioned tentacles. Ten oh, tentacles, yes, are, yes. tentacles play a large part in the book. Yeah, um, <laughs> yeah that, that and then there was, you know, the, the peacock's tail, which I that love. Was that was one of my brilliant. favorites, yeah. which was, um, you know, the, the, the idea behind it was that if, if you, you can tell if someone with a penis is aroused, we can't so much if someone has a vagina. And they got this little vaginal egg with and put moisture sensors on it. And those moisture sensors went triggered opened a big paper peacock's tail and it was just amazing as an art concept it was amazing but as as something that could be used as prosthetics you know that that could be incredible this was just prototyped in 24 hours and I was just so amazed at the stuff and you know people who were hacking vibrators so they were controlled by sound or by hand gestures and yeah, just a whole world of stuff. The, the cryptocurrency, do you remember that one? Yes. So they yeah. made a, there was a, a group, very, <laughs> very goldsmith. They made a, um, a sexual cryptocurrency so that you had to, you had to rub a, a leather wallet. And it, if you rubbed it hard enough, it generated a crypto coin. <laughs> and, uh, yeah. It's just, that was amazing. It said, you know, you can, you can love money or you can love humans, but you can't do both to get, you know, to get your satisfaction. And it, it, just amazing stuff going on there. That was, it was just, a, it was uh, just prior to the Love and Sex with Robots uh, conference. It was, yeah, yeah. it was uh, just after, it, it was prior, just before, just, prior, just, just before, yeah, yes, yeah. Sorry, yeah, it was right. So it tied in, you know, we had this kind of four day, five days where I was just kind of running around going, you know, losing my voice and not sleeping, <laughs> but it was just incredible amount of fun. 
that's one of the things that's interesting with this yet again. I'm, I mentioned that the idea of the scientific explanatory. And I think through your, your work with sex robots gives people a different uh, context of scientific AI robot stuff, all that kind of way of thinking of things as scientific. But actually, there's, there's a kind of crossover with, with the whole creativity and the arts. And I think what you're doing, it actually opens that out using the idea of robot sex to explore those. There is so much to be explored around it. I think that's very interesting. And I do think that that's one of the issues that I have with the current form of sex robots is that they're in a humanoid form. I, I, supposedly a realistic human form we are really really bad at making human robots i mean we're terrible at it um not just in engineering terms but that we can spot a mile off because of the uncanny valley um, phenomenon we can spot a mile off if something isn't real and so i think if we want to suspend disbelief maybe there are other avenues we can use so the question that i wanted to look at in the book you know one of the things was is there something compelling about the human form that's required for people to form an attachment to these robots. And I think, I mean, first, spoiler for the book, I think this is quite a niche market but I, in the current form. But I think that with the with the um, advances in AI, we see more and more plausible forms of attachment to, to the AI rather than to the robotic form. That's quite interesting because some of the things that I'm interested in is, you know, the, co the concept or context of an evolutionary sexual strategy, which might in you, in, use our relationship with technology and robots as part of that. And I think um, the, the whole context of the, the definition of sex robot, does it have to be gendered? Does it have to be, or can it be this different nebulous form? How will that change our concepts of how we are aroused yeah i think that's a, it's really good uh, yeah i completely agree and the the market for the current form of sex robots is it's very much marketed at, at straight men and um there's a lot of people saying well we have women don't want that sort of thing there are women who buy sex dolls but they're very they keep it very quiet um and i think well yeah well first of all probably no one's really asked women if they want them but women don't get asked a lot of stuff about tech <laughs> um, yeah. um i think that in that form sex robots are kind of a microcosm of the tech industry as a whole because you have it with a very dominant default market and that reflects what's going on in silicon valley and even if it is a niche market as i suspect the current form is um it doesn't stop it being fascinating insight into the way we work with tech what it means for us to to be human and what it means for us to feel attachment I think um, one of the, the pointers I mentioned, your work is, is socially challenging in relation to gender and body image and uh, feminist ideologies. Yeah, I, mean, I met some f fantastic people when I was doing this. Um, so uh, Chrissy Apuch, who's doing work on um, sex robots from a queer Latina perspective, which was really, really interesting um, because they, took, uh, they did a visit to Real Doll and had exactly the same experience as me, as me and went, this is something that doesn't represent me. This is something that doesn't speak to me. And yet there's something hugely compelling. And that was very interesting to explore as well. You know, there's clearly, there's clearly something hypnotic almost about the, the, this form of technology and something that draws us in. Um, but where is the place for us if we don't fit that market, if we don't fit that demographic? And we know that the sex tech industry is, has been estimated to be worth about, I think it's $30 billion by 2020. And I mean, that is, that's, that's a lot. That includes things like you know VR and and sex toys and dating apps, hookup apps, things like that. Um, and you know, if there's that much money going to sex toys and and sex robots, it's just a fraction of that, a tiny fraction. Then maybe there's a crossover point. Maybe there's somewhere where we can bring the two together. So we have these more immersive experiences. We have more embodied experiences that aren't focused on some kind of humanoid replica of a human. And of course, what about the people who want to stop? <laughs> all of this there are people yeah there, well, there are there are people and um so there has been there's been a campaign against sex robots which initially um wanted to ban sex robots then back, backtracked a bit onto wanted to do ethical development which is what we all want and then doubled down and said well we would we'd like to ban sex robots and also sex dolls and 
in some way, there are some aspects of that campaign that I, I think are whole merit. Um, I agree that the current form is object, objectifying women. I think it contributes to the body image problems we see in many, many other forms, um, media, music, film, all those sort of things. Um, but the stance is very different in that that, that campaign is, is very much coming from an angle um, that is is anti-sex work. Um, and the, the default um, assumption there is that that is something that is wrong and that will be mirrored by sex robots. I, I don't think that's the case. Um, I think what what I found reassuring was the more I looked into it, the more I saw people interacting with the dolls and talking about what they wanted, people are so people were so respectful of the dolls. There was nobody was was buying these to harm them. Nobody was buying them to, in, to enact violence on them as some kind of outlet of violence. Um, the two groups were really um, people who want the experience of, you know, they want it as a substitute for a real woman because maybe they can't have a relationship with a real woman one way or another. Um, and the others were fetishists who were pleased by the fact that this was a doll. And I know you've done work in sort of androidism and fetishism of this sort of thing. And so there were these these two kind of groups. And then there's other people who, who buy the dolls so they can pose them and photograph them. Um, but obviously people aren't going to admit that they buy dolls and enact violence upon them. But, but, you know they're paying upwards of five five thousand dollars. They're not they're not setting out to deliberately harm them. And most people give them backstories, dress them up, um, incorporate them into their lives day by day. And I think to say that that there's some kind of automatic jump from this relation, this lifestyle, into some kind of real world violence or real world depravity is just a leap too far. I was lucky enough to meet um, Stefan and Irene, his doll Irene. And it was in Zurich. And um, he was absolutely devoted to this doll. Yeah. He he dressed her up in expensive jewellery. He took her out to restaurants. He took her around to families for Sunday lunch. Um, and he was he was completely devoted to her. And um, I found that, that sensitivity actually really... Um, not shocking, but astonishing, because uh, I, I'm, I, I assumed in a fetishistic context it would be something slightly different. But there, there was a, a complete sort of um, love element that yeah. was happening with this doll. We definitely, there's definitely attachment. Um, I think that, that much is clear. And I know there was a lot of the criticism is is is, is that you, you know you shouldn't or you can't or you you know you won't form attachments with things that aren't living. Uh, I, don't, I don't think that's true. I don't think that attachment has to be reciprocated to be valid. And there are people falling in love with people all the time and it isn't returned to them. Um, so I think that that feeling can be completely one way. It might not be the same as a relationship that, that goes both ways and that everyone is happy in mm. it. Um, but it doesn't make it any less valid. And, uh, you know, I don't want to, I'm not going to judge someone if that's how they find their happiness. They're not, there's, there's no harm here, you know. And, and I looked, I looked very hard for evidence of harm. You know, I, I, I wanted to see, is there, any, is there any truth to this that this will spill into kind of real world damage? And I just couldn't see it. Mm -hmm. I think um, from that context, some of the, the things that you talk about with, the, with the, your experiences of meeting people and, and just seeing these, uh, these big sex dolls is the way you bring humour into, in, into <laughs> like this. like a pun. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> it, it's... it's um, I, uh, from page to page, I could find that there was some nice little uh, footnotes that were really, really funny. And I think um, that's one of the things that, that is lacking in general discourse about this is actually the human condition has lots of humor about it. And I think this is a really brave thing to put into this kind of book. Thank you. I mean, you, you, I, in fact, there's a quote from you in it about you saying this This is fun. This is absurd and funny and amusing because it's sex and that is kind of funny. Um, and, you know, it, there's there's so much of that. And if you can't make a joke about it, I mean, we have the best puns, don't we? Yeah, we, <laughs> do. we do. But it was refreshing to see that in, in, in a book that also had some really solid scientific considerations. And the other thing I found really interesting was that the deep philosophies that you actually go into, the, the philosophical context of what the sex robot means to us as humans and what 
love and attachment and connection actually means as yeah. well. And actually the philosophy part, I mean, there's, there's, there's actual philosophy in it. I got, I got my whole head tied up in that because I'm not a philosopher. Was, Everybody who's not a philosopher great. goes, oh, I'm not a philosopher. But I had philosopher friends who, who very kindly proofread that for me um, because there's stuff that ties me in knots. I mean, you just, certainly the stuff around consciousness where there, there's it's an area of huge debate. And um, I find it really interesting because it was, it was, a topic that I'd read up on before, but I hadn't tried to explain it to someone and I hadn't quite got my head around it all myself. So I, I find that quite challenging, but fun to do. Um, but you know, it just all, it all boils down to this sort of need to feel connected to people and a fear that we're going to be replaced, whether that's being replaced in our jobs or being replaced in our homes or being replaced in our beds. The, the other thing from that philosoph philosophical context was the... Um, idea of artificial intelligence coming in to the the robot and you, you talk um, a fair bit about Sergi Santos and what had happened to him yeah. with his robot and the idea of um, the the robot appearing to think for itself and how people project certain types of identity and things onto these robots yeah there's a lot of that and I think um, Sergi's had a, a bit of a rough deal um he had set out very well intentioned to make Samantha his sex robot. Then he ended up making about him and his wife made about 25 of these and they work out of their own home. Um, and his, his robot, Samantha, you know, he wasn't interested in the, in the body. He just used the body of a, of a sex doll, but he was putting all his work into the AI and he, he was doing some interesting stuff. Um, and even though, you know, I don't necessarily agree with, with the way, the, the sort of outcome of what it was going to be like, I find his work really, really interesting because he wanted to do a reciprocated relationship. He wanted to make it so that the, the robot would engage, the AI would engage, and that you had to woo her in a way and you had to build up a rapport with the robot. Um, but he got terrible time in the press um, because there was lots of reports saying that the, the robot Samantha had been molested at a trade show. Um and when I looked into that story, and I got his side of it, and I looked at all of the stuff that had gone on, and essentially what had happened was um, he had brought Samantha to a show, and said to people, "Well, you can go and, and touch, you know, go and go and feel and touch this this doll, this this robot." And of course, everyone did because if you're told that you can handle an artifact, say a museum setting or whatever, of course you go and you grab and you poke and you, you know, this has happened in the Museum of Sex in New York when they had real dolls on display. People want to feel what they're like. People they're given an invitation. They want to go and poke, and so the the, the news papers had reported all of this as sex doll molested robot you know sexually molested and attacked and it, it, no it wasn't that was not that was not why I was there it was not any kind of um sexual violence behind that it was people it was people pushing the limits of of touching and feeling and, and trying to focus on, and these are delicate objects and the impact it had on Sergi in the end yeah he's was... kind of he's kind of given up now which you know I think is is sad in many ways it's really put him off it's put him off talking to the media it's put him off developing any more on the doll so he, he says he's going to continue with his work in different fields that are related to this but it's really put him off doing any of that because we've we've all had certain interesting press <laughs> <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> <laughs> my favorite was um when the daily mail ran a picture of a sex robot with my name and credentials <laughs> underneath it <laughs> i was i was vaguely flattered um, <laughs> but i think you know you're not You've, you've not made it till you've been called a boffin, a, a sex boffin in the press, really. <laughs> I've, I've, I've had the, the phone calls and emails saying, uh, and, and when can we watch you having sex with the robot? Yeah. And so when, when, um, when Love and Sex with Robots conference came to, to Goldsmith's, um, David's conference um, and Adrian's conference, and um, Sarah Cox, who's here, who was the, handling all the press at the time, and the question, there were people just phoning up going, and can we see these sex robots? Will you be showing us how, they, how, they, how they're used? <laughs> it's an academic <laughs> conference. We're talking about legal and ethical and technological factors. We're not, we don't actually have any sex robots. Um, but yeah, there's just this immediate media hype around it. I think the, the media hype comes from all the things we think about when we think of all the films and the TV yeah. culture. And you talk about that quite extensively. Yeah, and I was delighted that um, during writing the book, when I started writing it, there was a new project set up um, in Cambridge at the Leverhulme Centre for the Future of Intelligence called AI Narratives. And it's honestly, it's one of my favourite projects that's running because they are looking specifically at how our vision of technology is shaped by science fiction and it's fascinating and I've been really lucky to go along to workshops there and there's currently there's going to be a book out on that in, in we're 
writing the paper now. Um, but, uh, there's going to be a book out about that. But, you know, how I have years and years of being fed this, these images and these plot lines affected how we see technology? And we know it does. We definitely know it does. And if it has done that how can we shape that for the future can we can we shake that up can we create new narratives I mean, that's the really interesting thing and you also say that you were lucky enough to go to the uh, the place where they filmed Ex Machina. <gasps> yes, I went to Ex Machina, um, the Ex Machina Hotel. It's a hotel in, in, in Norway. And it's amazing. And I got this email inviting me to go there for an AI retreat and spent um, four days there. It is just the most beautiful place I've ever been. And yes, we all did the kind of hand on the glass, kind of silent scream, uh, reenacted that, you know, and reenacted the entering into the lodge. It was it was phenomenal and it was a really good retreat. And actually we spent a lot of that time talking about ethics and design and it was really, really interesting. Yeah. yeah that's what I'm going to talk about, ask you to talk about next is um, the idea of uh, the ethically radical context that some of the, the things you talk about in, in what I see as very measured language. And I think what, what, what you say is very legally prophetic. You know, what, what is going to be the future? Will there be robot rights? What, what yeah. can we think about? It's, it's really interesting because we, AI ethics has really become a big thing in the past year. Um, and, you know, MIT, you're just setting up a new AI ethics um, center. Um, we had, you know, we lots of the APPG on AI in the House of Parliament. Oh, we had Pe Pepper the Robot giving it, um, evidence oh, yeah. to the Education <laughs> Committee the other day. That's dire. Um, <laughs> the, what a gimmick. Um, we, you know, we have things like that. We have things like um, uh, um, Sophia the Robot getting citizenship of Saudi Arabia. Uh, um, <laughs> yeah, yeah, I'm not yeah. happy about that either. Um, but yeah, so this this has all really sprung up, and and I think it's it's fascinating. And you know what what should happen here around things like deception, and should we be creating um, AIs, not even the robots, but the AIs as well, that might fool us into thinking they're human? And Google did this recently with Google Duplex, where they um, they were able to make an AI that sounded human on a phone because it went oh, um, you know, and people were going, That's, hang on a minute. And you can't tell half the time if you're talking to a bot online. You know, I, I, I very carefully say thank you to them all because I'm not sure what time I'll get a human and what time I don't. Um, and, and I think we, it's so easy to form a conversational bond with an AI because we are social creatures and that is how we work. All our interactions with technology come from that sociality. Um, there's been lots of work on that in human-computer interaction over the years. And I, I find that absolutely fascinating and also the gender thing that creeps in there, like all of our um, voice AIs originally starting as female voices because we like giving orders to women. Um, and, you know, there's all these myths around why that is. Oh, they prefer women's voices. Well, there's no evidence of that, actually. It's not scientifically proven. Um, and I, I think this, there are times when we need to really shake up what's going on. I was lucky enough to be one of the Liebner Prize judges uh, last year, was it, the year before, um, and, and speaking to one of the sort of artificial intelligence bots and trying to have conversations with them. And I had one that got stuck and kept going, uh-huh, uh-huh, <laughs> every, time, every time I asked it a question. So I, I understand where you're coming from on, on, in that context. But I, I also think um, the idea of things like... Um, Alexa and all those kind of things. The, the idea of the, the female context, I think, is really interesting. And I think what you bring to the table with this book is a really clear way of questioning gender context and gender fluidity with how we address our technology. Yeah, it's also me getting on, you know, getting on my bandwagon and my high horse and going, this is ridiculous, we shouldn't have this. Um, but it was interesting, I, I did a talk... Um, this week uh, at um, MCUBE's conference on why do bots have a gender? And someone in the audience in the questions uh, came up with this great idea that says, you know, why, when we, ha when we speak to a, an AI assistant, why don't we have just like a random a random person's voice coming back at us each time. So, you know, one time you could be answered by a bloke, one time you could be answered by a woman, one time you could be answered by a child, and it's just random luck. And that way we're not expecting this whole personality built around the voice. And I think that kind of thing's really interesting. We could do that. Mm -hmm shuffle for Alexa. You mentioned a child's voice. Of course, one of the problems uh, yes. that we often get is we get these wonderful people interviewing us and talking to us <laughs> about <laughs> cyber about sex and tech and robot, and then it's about what about, what about the, well, no, well, no one, well, no one think of the children. Yeah. Yeah. And, and 
okay, yeah, this is absolutely some an area that we need to be concerned about. Absolutely, but it's not a new thing. This is something that is already the, the, this country had a crackdown last year on um, the importation of childlike sex dolls, and um, there are prosecutions being made um, on quite an arcane law because there's no actual the law can't keep up with the developments. There's no actual law on the ownership. It's about the importation, but the people have been arrested and prosecuted for this. It is illegal in this country and many others to make computer gendered imagery of, of child abuse. And so, yeah, it's a problem if this happens. But first of all, you're not going to get any workshops admitting that they're making these things. And secondly, it's going to be stuff under the radar the same way that the, the, the dolls are. And third, yes, it should be regulated because it mirrors a real world parallel that has the abuse of vulnerable people. So I have no qualms about saying this is something we must keep an eye on. And there have been people saying, well, perhaps this could be something that's used in a therapeutic context for treatment of sex offenders. And that's been used for VR, has been used for that. That may be the case, but again, it needs to be done under, under regulations and control. So it's, it's a small area, but it does tend to come and dominate the conversation quite a bit. I think you, I think you cover the context with that really well in the book, actually, and, and come up with some really reasonable context and really thought-provoking answers to that question so I think you're really brave yet again to approach some of these things in the book so one minute we've got some really humorous context <laughs> and then we've got something quite you know quite there are hard some hitting. there are some dark parts I mean there's, there's really dark parts um and the stuff with the incels was dark as well you know there's all these articles came out um about oh, give incels sex robots and that will make them you know that will they'll stop wanting to kill women then and I think well no they won't because it's you know that misogyny just doesn't go away and and there's, they're not going to be happy with whatever they are given, I don't think. Um, but going on to read those forums and things was not—it was not a pleasant. Yeah. yeah. So, how did you actually plan out that kind of research? I mean, did you have to really think, right? I'm going to look at this context. I'm going to get into these uh, forums, and then how did you? What kind of methodology did you use to actually look at all of that? Sheer panic, mostly. Right. Um, <laughs> <laughs> let's just say, if I write a second book, it will be a different strategy. No, I kind of was just following. It was kind of, kind of, um, just following leads and, and going off. I had a, I had a, a rough outline of what I wanted to do, um, and yeah, just really chasing down things. And I, I, would, I would keep getting distracted and down rabbit holes. You know, kind of like, oh, that's really interesting. Jim will attest that there was a very long discussion about the right Latin terms to use for artificial vaginas. You know, that went on for like. <laughs> five or six email exchanges before he went, you don't actually need to put this in. <laughs> um, so, you know, it's, yeah, it was just really interesting. I wasn't setting out to write. I mean, I kind of knew what areas I wanted to cover, that there would be something on ethics, that there would be something on attachment, stuff like that. But it, I didn't really know where it was going to go. Um, but it was a lot of fun going down those different routes and finding out where it would be. So, yeah, it was, it was good. And part of that, of course, it is your autobiographical context, because um, I can, I would, you know, we're friends on Facebook, and <laughs> and I could, I could see when you'd broken your foot mm. and it was all in plaster, and then I wrote and, about it, and then you wrote about <laughs> it in the book, and it's like, ah, I, I can remember when that happened. Yeah, and there's this, you know, you 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 mentioned some really deep family situations like your grandmother I talk about my granny yeah. yeah 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 I'm sure she would she's here now going whoa that's <laughs> she's fantastic she's not <laughs> <laughs> she's very horrified uh, yeah. No, yeah I talked about my, my my granny who um who had dementia and I was talking about care robots and saying you know my grandmother was incredibly independent and did not want to leave her home in her final years of life even though she wasn't really capable of looking after herself and if I could have given her the ability to stay in her home by providing her with some kind of assistant, you know, you know, robots or carers that people who could help her, you know, eat and, and get her around the place. And, you know, I would love to have been able to do that. And people are very quick to say we shouldn't have robot carers. You know, it's dehumanizing. It removes dignity. I don't think it does. I think it can give dignity. And sure, the ideal is always you want to have human contact, right? Because of course we want that, but that's not possible. We have an aging population. We are not going to be able to care for everyone out there. We know there's a loneliness problem. And if we can not replace humans, but assist in some way, I think that's a really good thing. So I think some of the things you talk about is this sort of abstraction of contact, which I think is quite interesting that you, you don't necessarily have to have 
a human object to make you feel cuddled. You don't, or... you don't. And I kind of people, every time someone says, "What's your ideal sex robot like?" and I keep saying, "Well, maybe something like a, a, a sexy sleeping bag <laughs> that kind of <laughs> can hug you and vibrate and soothe you and purr and stuff." You know, I, I don't think I don't think it's even about sex. I think it's about intimacy, and you know, sex can be part of that. Or you know, it, it's just this idea of feeling feeling good. And I, I kind of centered the, you know. Because I'm not a philosopher, there's lots of philosoph philosophical arguments about what is sex, what is love, what is attachment, and I kind of went, mm, I don't really understand those, so I'm going to go with how do I feel, <laughs> and so I kind of went the biological approach and said, you know, what is arousal, what is what is feelings of love, um, and so for me, it's kind of centered on how the person feels rather than what objectively does it mean to be in love or to have sex or anything like that. So what are the feelings that are there, and how can we accommodate them? Mm. I think um, some of the uh, design contexts are quite interesting, particularly with, um, I mean, there's all sorts of kind of fluffy animal toy things. Oh, yes, that are being, Yeah. Oh, yeah. Oh. So cute little yeah. seal pup yeah. robot. Yeah. These sort of things. But this is one of the fasc fascinating things about looking at sex robots. Yeah, is Paro's it, not a sex robot. Yeah, no, yeah, yeah, <laughs> no. It, it enables you to actually innovate out, outside, it radiates different ideas outside of that, that main focus. And I think that's what's interesting. As I said, the, the Sex Tech Hackathon is an example of just the way design yeah. changes. Yeah, we're so tied to the idea of schemorphism where we take something in the real world and we put it into a digital version or a mechanical version because we're familiar with it. And that's how we learn to use technology. We learn it through metaphors with the real world. And that works well up to a point, but then once we're familiar with the technology, oh, we can break it. Why, you know, why, why stick to it? You know, we've got we've got to grips with it. Let's explore what else we can do. And I think sex toys have got to that stage because they've moved away from the replicas of genitals through to the abstracted, interesting things. A lot of that comes about to get around obscenity laws. Um, so why are we doing that with sex toys and not with sex robots? And that that really interested me. So I kind of really got into the whole design side of things, and you know, I, I've worked for taught interaction design now for about 14 years and so I was really interested in how we could interact and how that changed our designs and what the overall user experience was. Does that also change our definition of what a robot is? Yeah because if we look at the robots we have around us today very very few of them are human-like at all. Um, you know, mostly they are specialized robots that work in you know, factory production lines or surgery or robot vacuum cleaners or milking machines, whatever. And, uh, okay, I know where you're steady. going with that. Steady, steady. <laughs> oh, yeah, this is Trudy's coming out now. <laughs> um, and, yeah, there's, there's a lot of, and there's a good design idea right there. Yeah. Um, <laughs> so there's, 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 they're all, but none of them look human. That's the thing. And so, you know, what can we do? Um, why, do we, why do we automatically expect that the one that we will use intimately would be like that. Um, is there something that we need to have this artificial replica of a, of a perfect human lover? Very Pygmalion approach. I think, I think the whole context of um, the future of all this stuff becomes really interesting. So I think we've got just a couple of minutes left. Can you tell me where you see the future of, of all this actually right. going? <laughs> right. <laughs> Um, okay, I, I think that there is a space for us to have technology that fosters intimacy, not to replace humans, but to augment our own relationships and at times stand in for humans. If you're, if you want to have that kind of interaction, if you want to have intimacy, if you want to have sex and you don't have someone to do that with, then maybe we can use technology to, I'm going to say fill that gap, but fill that gap. And um, if we if we want to, we can also use that technology to bring, bring us closer together. So things like smart sex toys that can be controlled in different locations, things like immersive technologies where we feel we are in, in, in a situation where we are loved, caressed, whatever. I think there's definitely space for that. And we've, we, we already have a lot of the materials we need to make those sort of things. I, I'd love to see more sort of wearable, wearable technology for intimacy. Uh, whether that's connecting you to, you know that someone out there is thinking of you. You know, if you, you maybe you, you can, you know, if a friend thinks of you, you get a sensor going off somewhere or a light lights up. You know, if you're lying in bed at night feeling lonely, then someone can give you a virtual hug. You know, that kind of thing. Or, or it could be something directly sexual. It could be an immersive experience where you're in VR and you have some yeah. great ideas yeah, about yeah, that. Yeah, yeah. Go on, tell yeah. us your ideas about that. Oh, um, 
Well, um, <laughs> got me on the spot here. Now, I'm interested in the um, space between the lover and the loved one and what happens in that space, whether it's real-time space or whether it's in a virtual space. And it's much like the artist with the space between the painter and the canvas or the drawer with the, the piece of paper. And it's that liminality that I'm quite interested in exploring at the moment. So, yeah, it's, it is literally watch this space that I, I'm looking at. That's very cool. So, True, it's got great stuff. Yeah. In there. Really cool stuff. So um, I think it's pretty much time to put questions over to the audience, but I just want to say, can you please put your hands together for the wonderful Kate Devlin? <laughs> Where's Luke? And do we have questions? We please? have a mic as well. Oh, disembodied voice. Yes, Luke. A disembodied voice <laughs> appears in the darkness. Do we have any fabulous questions? No. Anybody? Hi there. Oh, oh we got one. We got one at the I'm front. Wondering. Yeah. Yeah. We, yeah. Can Sorry. this? Yeah. Shall I go? Oh, oh, we've got another one. Hi. Yes. Oh, hello. I can't see you. But... I can't either. No, I... Yeah, yeah, I can see you. <laughs> no. Um, I, so I was just uh, so interesting. Thank you so much. That was really excellent talking set of questions. Um, I was curious about when you're saying, uh, n not something that I'd heard either about there wasn't too much like say physical harassment on behalf of the people who were getting the robots and using them. Uh, I thought that was a really interesting point. I was wondering, though, about the issue to do with um, silencing of women. So, obviously, one way in which you harm women isn't through, like, direct physical harassment, but it's through treating them as though they are an object in other respects, i.e. they don't have a voice, they don't have an autonomy, they don't have a personality. Um, I, it seems like a perfect scenario for yeah. that issue to <laughs> yeah, raise no, its head. Yeah, it does. And, and that's another reason why I sort of advocate moving away from that form. Um, there is this, I think the people who fetishize robots in particular, um, they, they it's the idea of the programmable woman, of the biddable programmable, programmable woman who can literally be turned off and turned on. And that is definitely a factor in, in a lot of it. Uh, and again, I'm not comfortable with that. I think there's, uh, there's already enough of that going on in real life. Um, I think the, the respect and the sort of sensitivity with which the doll owners treat their dolls, I don't think that's, I don't think that's something that they, they explicitly do um, or would explicitly express that they do, but I do think that plays into it. Um, but I think for a lot of people, it's a, it's a companionship thing rather than a power thing. Um, but I don't think it makes it justifiable in the long run to have these sort of female forms of all of these. Thank you. Anybody else? Oh, we've got a gentleman, oh, gentleman at the front here. Oh, and there's another lady at the back there. So if we go to you first and then the other lady at the back. If we go to you first or... Oh, oh we'll go to the lady, lady at the back there. <laughs> oh, yeah, are you there? We got we got the microphone. Who are you doing first? So no, you can no, yeah, me. you can go first. Me. You can oh, go first. Okay. And then, yeah. Um, I just wondered what form, if not a female form, would this sex robot take? Because I don't understand. Um, yeah. So it depends. Um, so at the hackathon, we looked at different ways you could make it more embodied, more embodied to sex toys that aren't like humanoid figures so um some of the examples where there was a, a group that made a shawl that you could wear and it had sensors in it so that they said you could imagine a, an augmented reality or a virtual reality scenario where you walk through say a cloud of rose petals and you could feel them touch your skin so you could have that kind of experience where you're being caressed but you weren't being caressed by a another human or you know, perhaps it was another human, but only in your head or, you know, in the, the fantasy that you have. And I think you can abstract it out like that. So there was another group that made the, the, the sensory hammock that could squeeze, that had tubes in it. You get in it and it squeezed you tight and held you. Um, so, so things like that rather than, um, rather than embodied human form. But then again, I also think that the potential for AI is, is there where 
um, people form rapports with AI that don't require a body. And the film Her is a really good example of this. It creeped me out. That film creeped me out so much because it just seemed plausible. Um, not and boring. Within, and boring. boring. <laughs> well, it's your manic pixie dream bot. You know, he's, she's come along to rescue this guy who's very really sensitive. Bored. Yeah. Um, and I just thought, you know, this is this is kind of the sort of thing I could see where people get connected to to something like that. I mean, the Ashley Madison um dating site Pete, there were met married men on there looking for affairs and they were talking to bots and they had no idea they were talking to bots uh and i think that you could do that you could have an entire relationship with someone online and have you seen you know, maniac no i haven't i've heard of it I there's seen one it. scene i think you should watch it um, okay I'm gonna watch where this. it's kind of i've like, seen the first episode yeah, sorry, sorry. Sorry. No spoiler, spoiler, spoiler alert spoiler alert <laughs> third episode okay <laughs> like, well, okay i've seen the, i've seen the first episode and went what is this? So I'm going to get into trouble here. Sorry. sorry. Okay. No spoilers. <laughs> uh, but yeah, I think, I think that's really interesting. And yeah, you could, you could, you could do a whole life online and not know who you were talking to. I mean, I've, I've, I've gone on dates before where the person who turned up wasn't the person in their dating profile picture. And you think, you know, what if that person didn't really exist and they were just an AI or a bot online? But I had that the, probably better for you though. Yeah. <laughs> probably would be rather than someone who was cheating on his wife. I, I had a, <laughs> Thank you. I had a, a couple of friends who were in their car and they had, it was the time when you had the, the Tom Tom sat nav thing and it would say, take the next left and you'd take the next left. And this was a woman's voice and the, the husband and wife were sitting in the front and he was driving and it said, take the next right and he took the next right. She went, you're always doing what she says, you never do what I fucking well say. And it was like, they had this huge argument. Over the sat Over the sat -nav. Whereas uh, my mum and dad are here and, and they would like to, I remember them saying that they, they both like to disagree with the sat -nav, so they stay on friendly terms. So. <laughs> <laughs> so. Have we got another question? Did, did, did you still want to, to do your question? Oh, there you go. Uh, hi, yeah, no, really enjoyable talk. Um, so, I, I mean, I work as a technologist, I work as a software engineer, um, and it's quite common that, uh, a technique or um, an approach to interacting with humans may emerge in one field and then migrate to another. I wonder, you know, outside of the actual sex or even perhaps you know, the, the intimacy of the, the sex robot, if there are things that are being learned in this field that may make their way into other ones and what that might be telling us about the future of AI or the future of human interactions. I think it certainly could. And I think in terms of care and companion robots, it's definitely, there, there is work being done there that will certainly feed into the sex robot side of things, although they're, they're going to say they don't want that to happen. Um, but I think the what Abyss Creations are doing with their AI sort of girlfriend personality is really interesting because they're gearing it up so you can have that her like experience where you can carry around an app. You know, it's like, $20 for this Android app and you've got your girlfriend in your pocket wherever you go and they are bringing out a male version as well um, but they have to tweak the AI because the male version can't say things like hey I'm going to wear that sexy dress for you um, so, <laughs> oh they're, say they're, that again that was can, nice hey I'm going to wear that sexy dress for you. <laughs> oh that'll do uh, <laughs> there is an audio book of my book available um, <laughs> um, yeah so so I think you know that's that's really interesting that the I think, you know, you can see a lot of people wanting that for the companionship rather than the dirty talk. Um, people talk dirty to um, virtual assistants all the time. And in fact, um, the companies have to write in patches to kind of for, for harassing Alexa. Which is, but people will. They'll push the boundaries, right? It's like a, like a kid with a calculator spelling boobies. You know, it's like, <laughs> what can you do with the technology to make it rude? <laughs> do we have another question? Thank you. <laughs> Hello. Uh, first off, that was a really fascinating talk Thank over you. here. Wherever hey. you are. <laughs> here. Oh, no. <laughs> Hi. Um, so I work in the kind of public policy area, and I was wondering what you kind of thought the future of this debate was going to be. Are you optimistic about the sort of what's going to change, or do you think the kind of the campaign against sex robots is going to have their way? Um, no, because I, I, I don't think, uh, <laughs> I don't think they will because, uh, well, I know they'd like to, but, um, there's really nothing, we don't have the evidence for any of this yet. It's, it's you know, we can't make any evidence-based decisions because we don't have any evidence. Um, and we are not seeing a threat enough yet other than the, 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 the child thing that we've talked about. There's not really any demonstrable evidence that there is damage or need of regulation um so i can't see it being 
a sort of a, a policy um, talking point anytime future. Though I, I, I think I'm the first person to say sex robots in the House of Lords, um, an, an evidence giving, a, a PPG evidence giving um, session. Um, I'm not sure they quite expected that, <laughs> but I mean that's professionally they may well have discussions in the House of Lords about sex robots behind the scenes. I don't know, um, but yeah, I think I think there are, we don't need to worry yet um, because it's quite niche still. But I think we should be thinking ethically long term about AI anyway, and there are lots of questions that come into that around areas like deception and care and disadvantaging people and objectification those are all conversations we need to be having but whether or not they make it to the policy level is another thing there's there's also um the weaponizing of sex robots i think you mentioned yeah. one with the the, the the bullets coming out of the yeah, nipples yeah Austin right? fembots with with bullets firing out of the nipples yeah uh we're, we're way off that yeah um let's work on the killer robots first <laughs> any more questions have we got another one over there? Oh, we've got another one here. Hi. Fantastic. And I'm, I've got my book and I'm really looking forward to starting it tonight. So, yeah. I actually just wanted to follow up, though, into that more real end of this. So, um, because if we look at um, how technologies have become accessible quite fast across time, I mean, I'm working with motion capture, which we were all tethered to the ground in the 90s and then, you know, suddenly Connect is in every, you know, lots of living rooms. And we know there's lots of examples of that with like Skype where telepresence was only for businessmen and et cetera. So it's about a reducing costs, yeah? So, yes. so what happens when sex robots are not $5,000 and when they are mass market? And that isn't surely that far off because we see reduction in costs very fast in tech market. I think I think it's it's not necessarily the production of them that will limit it. I think it's that there will not in their current form, the Uncanny Valley is doing so much and it's such a, a niche area that like sex dolls, I think it will stay fairly niche because people aren't that interested in the form that they're currently in because they a lot of them look like bad shop mannequins that can move their mouth a bit and make some groaning noises. I wonder if, I think that if it was, if there was an advance in human-like robotics so that we could get a much more sophisticated one, that may change things. But I'm, I, I don't see it becoming um, something that's widespread just only due to reduced cost. I think there'd have to be more of a social adjustment to it. One more question. We've got time for one more question, Luke. Oh, oh, oh. <laughs> Yay! <laughs> Hi, Laura. Then we've got one more. Okay, Hi. okay. I'm so excited about your book. It looks amazing. I love the cover. Um, my question was, do you think it's possible to love a sex robot? Yes. <laughs> oh, please can you tell me more yes <laughs> laura's got a book coming out about love by the way um so yeah i do because um i think that love doesn't have to be reciprocated to be a valid emotional state and it you know there are many ways of defining love does it have to be returned does it have to be mutual all that sort of stuff i think it's perfectly possible um i don't think it's going to be um a necessarily a, a, a human human like love i think it's a new thing um, and we are, it's a new social category. And with robots, we are seeing emerging new social categories. And so it might not be that love that you feel for another human, but it may well be a love that you feel for something. I'm not going to say like a pet because that sounds a bit odd, but you know, that kind of thing where, you know, you have, you have something that you care about, um, and you're attached to, but you may not, you know, you may not feel the same way as you would about a partner. But I do think that it's possible to have those strong feelings. I've got two budgies, so I know what that means. Yeah, yeah. One more question. One more question. Oh, uh, Jesus, at the sorry. back, apparently. Yeah. <laughs> All right. yeah, I want to return to the first question, Kate. Really, which was about um, um, you know the, the kind of the com compliant nature of very a lot of the AI. As somebody who used to work in a caring profession, this kind of relates both to the sex a aspect and the caring aspect. Most females in this kind of thing are, are portrayed as being compliant. Yep. Now, what would happen to these guys with the sex robots if their um, sex robot had PMT <laughs> or if they were actually, they answered back? Now, would we then see the violence? Because people in, and the same for people in caring uh, professions, they have to kind of tune into the needs of the person they're looking after rather than occasionally lose their call because they get frustrated with the way that the person's 
um, behaving. So I think that the, there are real problems with kind of using a female compliant model for the, the for the AI, really. I, I agree. I think that, that we need to really get sort of sort that one out because I do agree that there's a problem with the subservient female and it's been the model and it's been around for a very long time. Um, so Sergi with the Samantha robot was trying to do a bit of this in that you had to be polite and nice to her. It. Um, I, I tend to gender the robots even though they're not things with gender. Um, you had to be nice to this robot in order for her to return the niceness to you. And I thought that was what made his so very interesting that he was building that sort of thing in. And of course, we don't need to do that. We can we can program them to be as subservient as we like. But it was an interesting model. And it kind of led on to thinking a lot about consent. What happens if we ever have conscious robots, which I don't think is going to happen anytime soon, if at all. Um, I'm not. I'm, I'm one of those people in AI that's agnostic about whether or not we'll ever have sentient machines. I think that we could, and if we do, we might not even recognize it. It may be a different type of consciousness altogether. Um, but it does bear thinking about long term. So yeah, I, I'm, I'm not happy in general with AI having this subservient female response. And it's something that seems to be built in, whether consciously or not, to all the systems. Um, the, the, we, we can... We can basically program what we want into these machines and would it be interesting to program in one that is tetchy or angry? I don't know. I don't know what to do. Whether or not it would spill into real life violence is a whole other thing because the evidence is so scant and we see very similar parallels with the computer video games industry where people said, well, if you have these violent games then it will spill into real life violence and we just don't have the evidence for that either. There are a number of studies that, that work both ways in, in terms of supporting that. Um, so I don't know, but I do agree with, absolutely agree with you that we should really not be relying on this subservient female model. So Luke, shall I bring this to a close now? Where's he going? Go ahead, Trudy. Yep. Okay. So the virtual futures conclusion is I want to end with this reminder for those interested in the future. Some things that may seem imminent or inevitable may never actually happen except with us for what we think about. <laughs> Fortunately, our ability to survive the future is not contingent on our capacity for prediction. Although sometimes, and on those much more rare occasions, something remarkable comes of staring the future deep in the eyes and challenging everything <laughs> that's, that it seems to promise. I hope you feel that we've done that this evening. So please join me in thanking the most amazing Dr. Kate Devlin. And the books can be purchased at the side of the stage and will be signed by the author. Thank you very much. And thank you, Lou. Thank you, Trudy.